title of our sermon today is The Summary, because we come to the summary of the Sermon on the Mount. And it says in verse 24, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on the house. And it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them, he will be like the foolish man who built the house on the sand and the rains descended, the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell and great was its fall. In 2004, there were 15 named storms and nine hurricanes and four of those hurricanes came through the state of Florida. You remember them, some of you that were here, Charlie, Francis, I, uh, Ivan, and Jeannie. Now, I don't mean does it, there are so many new people in Florida, and a lot of you are new to Florida. I don't mean to scare you half to death, okay? And uh, Because uh, storms do come, hurricanes do come to Florida. I would tell you that three out of the four of those hurricanes that came through Florida that year, the eye of the storm, which is very rare and unusual, but the eye of the storm came through the city of Winter Haven. And um, when the first Hurricane Charlie came through Winter Haven, August the 13th, uh, on Friday, Friday the 13th, we suffered um, a lot of damage to our homes. Many of you remember that. But the thing that I remember was the city was without electricity, as true of, of most of those hurricanes. I think all three of them, uh, to some degree, people were without electricity. But we got word out to as many as we could that we were going to have services that Sunday morning. However, there was no electricity. And so we had services outside underneath our breezeway. It was a smaller crowd that day. But during that outside service, we heard a medical helicopter that came over our church and we had no idea that it was one of our church members that was in that medical uh, helicopter that day. Jerry Curlis left her house. She went into her motorhome. She went in there and because there was a generator in the motorhome and she was getting ready so she could come to church that day. Well, the motorhome, for some reason, uh, unknown reason, I don't remember, uh, that it um, something sparked in there and the motorhome blew up. And she was severely burned. And that's why they were airlifting her to the Tampa General Hospital. And there she fought for her life for 30 days. And then she finally died. There, And, and by the way, I went by and saw uh, Jerry and uh, Sarah and I did right before she went off to college. And uh, we had a van load of water that we took down to the church in Port Charlotte right after that. We went down that way. And uh, because of a church that had been hit pretty hard back there, back then. But you know, there are a lot of hurricane stories that I could tell you. Uh, some are about the storms that we face and the difficulties that we face from them. I could tell you a lot of stories about that. But I could also tell you about the storms that others have faced and that we helped them. them. So as what I just spoke about of taking some water down to the church there in Port Charlotte. You know, and, uh, and with all that said, I would tell you, I have pastored for almost 42 years, and I've been around, around long enough to understand that storms keep coming. I understand that. And you would think that once we have gone through a storm, a really bad storm, that we wouldn't face any more storms. But the fact of the matter is, Christian, storms keep coming. And today I'm talking about, when I'm talking about storms, whether it's financial storms, physical storms, emotional storms, spiritual storms, and yes, meteorological storms, they keep coming. God often uses storms in the Bible as illustrations about the difficulties and the decisions of our lives. And Jesus closes out here the Sermon on the Mount with an illustration of two houses, and how the two houses are built on two types of foundations, and then the Bible says a storm comes. When storms come into our lives, and they will, and they do, they have, and many of you are going through a storm even today, 
how you respond will come from the foundation of which you have built your life upon. And so we look, first of all, building God's way. In the text, Jesus is not talking about building our houses with cement, with stones and wood. That's not what Jesus is talking about. I think you understand that the houses are metaphors for the two ways that people build their lives. Jesus wants us to see that the first and most important um, feature of any solid permanent building is its foundation. That's the important thing. The foundation is, is important. You don't have to be a builder to understand. You've got to have a proper foundation because if you don't, um, uh, it, the, the building's going to lean or maybe it, it might collapse. I've known buildings that they've had to bulldoze down because of an improper foundation. You've heard of that. We've all heard of things of that nature. So everything on the outside, outside might look good, but without a proper foundation, the building is going to eventually collapse. Too many of our lives and too many of our homes are falling apart today because they weren't built upon a proper foundation. And if we do not properly construct our lives to protect ourselves when the storms of life come, then the enemy is going to come in and he is going to destroy. That's his intent. That's what he wants to do. Jesus gives us an example of two builders constructing houses on two foundations. And we're going to look at the foolish man first because I want to end up on the good man or that built his house upon the rock and be encouraged by that. So let's look at the contrast between these two builders. First of all, you see building on a sandy foundation and the consequences. Verse 26, But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on the house and it fell and great was its fall. Now this person built their house on the sand. Sand is unstable. It's always changing. It's always moving. Sand uh, offers no stability. Sand can never provide a firm foundation. And so the sand, when we're thinking of spiritually today, of God intending this for man to understand uh, that we build spiritually upon the Lord Jesus Christ, you understand that sand is composed of human opinions and attitudes and wills that are always shifting. They're unstable. Is that not true? Who would have ever thought people would think like they think today? I often think to myself, how could they think that way? How could they believe that? It's, uh, it's unstable. It's always shifting. That's the world we live in. To build on sand is to build on self-will and self-fulfillment and self-purpose and self-sufficiency and self-righteousness. People that build on the sand, that's what they build on basically themselves. They build upon um, man. And you cannot build upon man, we understand that. However, when adversity came upon the house of the foolish man, you find it disintegrated. The Bible says, and great was his fall. It came tumbling down. It was utterly demolished, leaving its builder with absolutely nothing. And that is the destiny of those who build on the sand of man's ideas, on man's philosophies, on man's religions. They feel like, well, all religions lead to God. No, they don't. That's a, that's a lie from hell. Because the Bible says that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to God the Father but by me. It's only through Jesus Christ, which we're going to see in just a moment here. But you can't build on man's religions. And it is not that such people will have little left, but they will have nothing left. Because you see, their way is not an inferior way to God. I would tell you that it is no way to God at all. You can't go their way. You say, well, you know, uh, we might not agree with everything, but, you know, I'll go my way. No, we go God's way, not man's way. And Jesus is very clear that his people are not to just be hearers of the word, but they're also to be doers. 
James tells us that in verse, chapter 1, verse 22, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. So don't deceive yourself into thinking just because you come to church and just because you hear the word of God that you're saved. Don't get, don't get that. I don't, don't think just because of that, you, that you know the Lord. And last week we talked about having fruit or evidence in your life that you have put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. It's, and I'm not saying that once we come to Christ that uh, we won't sin. We still struggle with that in our human nature. We struggle with that. But if you're saved, I promise you the Holy Spirit will convict you to be right with God and to do the work of God. The Holy Spirit will convict you of that. I'll give you a good biblical illustration, which is always astounding. Every time I've seen this, it's very mind-boggling to me. And that is Herod, the wicked king during the time of Jesus and uh, of John the Baptist was committing adultery with his brother's wife. And of course, John preached about that. And when he preached about that, Herod had him put in, put in jail uh, because of that for doing so. But interesting enough, in Mark chapter 6 and verse 20, it tells us that Herod used to enjoy listening to John the Baptist preach. He liked hearing the words of God. He liked that. He enjoyed it. This wicked king, living in open adultery, enjoyed listening to God's word. But I dare say that there are some who come to church, they listen to the word of God, but they don't know the Lord. They don't know the Lord. Now, we know that salvation is not based on what we do. We understand that. It's only by the works of Jesus Christ, not by our works. I'll tell you that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and in Jesus Christ's work on the cross alone. That's how we're saved. But those who do not know the Lord, one day the rain and the floods and the winds, in other words, the destruction is going to come, my friend, against them in God's final judgment. It's going to come. It's going to come raining down. Christian, I know that in, in Jesus is talking about, I believe that he's talking about those who are saved and those who are lost. I believe that he's talking about that. But I believe that there's an application in this talking about building your house upon the sand. Basically, that's lost people. But I think there's an application that we can, we, that's here for us too. And that is if we build our lives and our homes on anything other than God's word, then we're going to cause ourselves a lot of self-inflicted storms. There are going to be storms that come because that are self-inflicted that did not have to come, hardships that we will have to face in life that we would not have had to face had we lived for God. Because God's principle is, for whatever man sows, that shall he also reap. That's what the Bible says. Now, I've lived long enough to see calamity after calamity tear the lives of people apart because they built their lives and their homes on sand. They didn't build it on the Word of God. And Jesus' Word should cause every one of us to examine the landscapes of our lives. I'd like to move on to the second one, building on a spiritual foundation and its consequences. It says there in verse 24, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his home on the rock. And the rains, rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. And it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. Now, one, while one is built upon the sand or self-righteousness about man, is built on man, the other one builds on the rock, the, the Lord Jesus Christ. There, you see the two. Build on man, build on Jesus. What are you going to build on? The rock does not move. The rock is unchanging unstable, and, and stable. We know the Bible tells us in Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. So the rock offers a good and proper foundation for a house. You want the proper foundation. Jesus at proper foundation. A Christian builds their home on the rock, Jesus Christ. 
a real Christian builds their, their home on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the only way to properly build our lives is to build according to the plan of the one who created us. You think he knows what we need? You think he knows the direction we need to take our lives? God definitely has a plan for our life, but we can only have access to his plan if we have a relationship with him. That's the only way. You want to know the plan of God for your life? I often have people ask me, you know, I'm looking for God's will for my life. Well, my answer to them is get into the word of God, pray, be in church every time the doors are open, and uh, God will reveal it to you, what he wants you to do. Uh, God's plan pretty much is in God's word. You want to know God's plan? Read God's word. It's in there. That's God's plan right there. And building on the rock speaks of people who hear the gospel and they believe it to the point that they build their lives upon God's word. That's what they do. Rock builders understand that Jesus alone has the power to save souls. Only he does. Rock builders hear the word and they conform to the truths of God's word. And what God tells them to do in his word, that's what they do. They follow what God tells them to do. I like what J.C. Riley said, let us receive nothing, believe nothing, follow nothing which is not in the Bible, nor can be proved by the Bible. That's all we're going, that's what we're going to believe. That's where we're going to stand. We're going to stand on God's word. And I would tell you that when we are obedient to the Lord, to his word, it shows that we love him. But hear me now that I, I'll tell you, because we're selfish creatures, we all are, understand this, but being obedient to the Lord is for our own good. It's for our own good. It helps us. God knows what's good for us and what is best for us. And those who serve in the military and law enforcement are extremely familiar with this principle of listen and obey. They understand that because they know that it's imperative for their safety and for the protection of others. They understand that. In July of 1976, Israeli commandos raided a hijacked plane in the airport there in Uganda. Some of you remember that. In less than 15 minutes, all of the seven kidnappers had been killed and 103 Jewish hostages had been set free. I will tell you that, however, three hostages were killed. The, the kidnappers were killed. Three hostages were killed. But the commandos came in on that plane and they shouted in Hebrew, get down, crawl. That's why they, you know, and of course the kidnappers didn't understand. But um, so the Hebrews understood that. Most of them understood that and, obey, and obeyed that. But some, for whatever reason, hesitated and they were shot by the men that were trying to free them. Three of them died as a result of that. But I'm telling you, that obedience is commanded for our own good. For our own good. God tells us these things, uh, either to do or not to do. Uh, people say, well, I don't like thou shalt not in the Bible. Oh, you know, I don't like that part. It's for your own good. It's, it's to, to protect you, to take care of you. I like what Deuteronomy 6.24 says, and the Lord commanded us to uh, to observe all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is this day. It's for our good. That's why God uh, does what he does and tells us uh, to do what we ought to be doing. God's rules for our behavior, are they're not some arbitrary decisions made by a vengeful God, uh, creator. That, that's not our God. And they're there to protect us and to make our lives easier. So, what are the consequences for building your life on Jesus Christ? What are the consequences? John Blanchard said, joy is the natural outcome of the Christian's obedience to the revealed will of God. And so, yes, I understand and I know that storms come to all people regardless of how we build our house. If we build it on the sand, if we build it on uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, both of us are going to have storms come. And all of us have testified to that fact today. You know, you would understand. You've had storms in your life. 
you're a Christian, you're doing your best to live for God, and yet you had storms in your life, and you see people that don't know God have storms in their life. But hear me when I tell you today that when you have built your life on a proper foundation, you will be able to withstand those storms and the trials that come in your life. I'm glad that I've got the Lord there with me every step of the way, holding me up through those storms in life. I'm not in that storm alone. Thank God for that. Praise the Lord for that. I, I tell in our membership class, and y'all remember me telling this story that we're just in our class, but it's been over 50 years since Johnny Erickson Tata had her diving accident there in Chesapeake Bay, uh, which left her paralyzed and unable to move her arms and her legs. And uh, being a Christian, that did not keep uh, Johnny from being paralyzed, nor did it guarantee that she was going to be healed because she was a Christian. But most of us know her story of how that she has lived her life for God as a quadriplegic. She lived for God that way. Nobody might would have in the world might have never known her had it not been for that. But, you know, she, as you know, she is a Bible teacher. She is an artist. Believe it or not, she paints Christian paintings with her mouth. And it's astounding what she can do. And she's a speaker, author of many books and devotions. She encourages many Christians. Many of you have heard her on the radio. She's on many radio stations, and she's an encouragement to people. But her amazing outlook and strength of character comes from building upon the sure foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how she goes forth in life and is a, an encouragement and help to a lot of people in this world because of her sure foundation. I read the biography of evangelist uh, Ron Dunn. And in the book, he, it's, it tells of a horrible tragedy that happened within their home and how that it was very difficult for their family, but how they dealt with it. And he said, too often people ask the wrong question. Now, if you don't remember anything else about this message, I hope you'll remember this illustration, because if you're not in a storm right now, you will be in a storm one day. If you want to walk with God and be close to God, remember this illustration. I love it. This is what Ron Dunn said after he's faced the storm in his family, in his life. When you go through a deep hurt, the natural question is why or even why me? As a pastor, I've heard that phrase I don't know how many times from people. Why me? Why did this happen to happen to me? Why did this happen to happen to our family? Why me? He goes on to say, this is a question the world asks because in our you deserve the best culture, We have little patience or room in our lives for the valley. Is that true? That's that's the way we're geared. That's the way Satan wants us to think anyhow. And when your life is on the firm foundation, you have full trust in Jesus, you walk with him daily, the right question becomes, what now? Instead of why me, it becomes, what now, Lord? I'm trusting you, why now? Uh, Ron Dunn goes on to say, when your foundation is secure, no cracks, creaks, or groans, you know that the one whose army and family you're in has you in his hands and he wants the best for you. Then you will know that whatever you go through today is only clay he will use. And so whatever it is that comes in our life, God can take that and use it for his honor and for his glory. He can take that and use that. And we trust him that way. God, I don't understand why this has happened in my home. I don't understand why this has happened to me, but it's not why me. God, I'm not going to ask that question. I'm going to ask what now? God, I'm trusting you. You are my God. I believe in you. You are the almighty. So what now? What do you have for me? What's your, what's the purpose for me to carry out at this point? I had someone just the other day say, I just, I, you know, since my loved ones passed, I have no purpose. We have purpose. God has a purpose for all of us of what, what he wants us to do. But build your life on a good foundation and let God take care of the rest. God, God will take care of it. He will. God has a purpose for all of us. Let's move on to our second point, and that is believing God's word. Verse 28 and 29, and so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings 
that the people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Now, the words of Jesus and the Sermon on the Mount, I'm telling you, they're absolutely astonishing, these words. Go back and read them again. Go through uh, these chapters and read uh, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Jesus spoke eternal truth simply, directly, with love, without hesitation and consultation. His words of truth astounded the crowd. They were, now, how many came to Christ? We don't know. You know, I'm sure that some came to the Lord. God's giving, Jesus is giving the invitation. Some trust him and some are just astounded and they walk away the same way today. You have people sometimes they hear the word of God proclaimed and some are astonished by that. Some are convicted by it. Some are cre- receive Christ and some do not. How sad that it is for those who do not. But I will tell you that Jesus is speaking words of truth today the same way that he was speaking words of truth. We have it in God's word. And Jesus had presented his uh, listeners with, if you remember, the paired alternatives. We're coming down. I've told you we're coming down to the end of the Sermon on the Mount, and it's like Jesus is giving an invitation. And he's got these, and over the weeks, we got busted up from Easter, but over the weeks we've looked at the two gates and verses 13 and 14 of the narrow one leading to life are the wide one that is leading to destruction. And then Jesus gave the two trees in verses 15 through 20. The good one bearing good fruit and the bad one bearing bad fruit. And then last week we preached uh, about the two responses, uh, verses 21 through 23. And uh, that, uh, of the two responses, it's the genuine disciple who does the will of God and the hypocritical hearer that only gives lip service. And now today we come down to the two foundations, verse 21, 24 through 27, that one is built upon the rock and one is built upon the sand. And it's that we come through all this and it's as if Jesus is saying here, you've heard all these things that I have presented to you. Now what are you going to do about it? I've given you all these things. I've made it very clear. I've given you four illustrations here. What are you going to do about it? Church, what are we going to do about it? Many years ago, there was a man who lived in the forest, and he was struggling with a lot that he had read in the Bible. And one night, he walked out out into the woods, and he cried out to God. He said, oh, God, there are many things in this book I do not understand. There are many problems with it for which I have no solution. There are many seeming contradictions. There are some areas in it that I do not seem to, that do not seem to correlate with modern science. I can't answer some of the philosophical and psychological questions Chuck and others are raising, someone in his period of time. But then the story goes on that he fell on his knees as the Holy Spirit moved upon him, and this is what he prayed. Father, I'm going to accept this as thy word by faith. I'm going to be, I'm going to allow faith to go beyond my intellectual questions and doubt. And I will believe this to be your inspired word. That was the prayer that he prayed. And after he prayed, he stood up and wiped. His eyes were still stinging from the tears. But there he left that day, my friend, feeling the the power, the presence and the power of Almighty God. That man was Billy Graham. Billy Graham went on to become a spiritual giant for the Lord and literally thousands of people came to Christ. Why? Because God's word was the foundation for which he built his life upon, the word of God. In the midst of this shaking world, and oh, my friend, it is getting more shakier all the time. Is that not true? In the midst of this shaking world, a lot of things that we have enjoyed through the years, many years ago, unless you're a young person, uh, you know, many that have lived any length of time know that we have enjoyed some good and wholesome things in this nation. Uh, we've enjoyed in America. However, it's sad as we see them departing and passing away and diminishing However, I want to remind you of the early Christians. Anytime I get discouraged 
of thinking how bad things are going in America and that we're going to lose this country, which I think probably we've already lost this country. But when I think about that, I, rem- I, I reflect back. It's almost like the Holy Spirit reminds me of what the early Christians went through. Let's remember that. Let's don't forget that. Even though the temple was destroyed and Jerusalem fell, and even though the believers were persecuted and displaced and dispersed, they had hope. They had hope, friend. Their focus remained on God and the things of God. Hear me when I tell you today, hope is not in a place like America or wherever it might be. Hope is not in a place or possessions, but in the person, Jesus Christ. That's, that's important. Don't ever forget that. Let's don't be discouraged and defeated. Let's don't put our hope in the world or even in this country. Let's remember that we serve the God of the ages, the creator of this universe. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Hear me today, Christian, I'm telling you, all other ground is sinking sand. It's sinking. God's word gives us all the power we need in order to live in this life. So these four and final challenges by Jesus cause us to a decision or to a response. That is, it's a call for unbelievers to put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, or it's a call of discipleship for believers. Stand up, live for God, be what you ought to be. Be not only hearers, but doers of the word. At the beginning of World War II, aerial bombings flattened a lot of Warsaw, Poland, And cement blocks and raptured plumbing and shards of glass were strewn everywhere in that city and Warsaw. But in the downtown, however, most of the damage, uh, there was one building there. A lot of the buildings damaged, uh, a lot of them totally gone. But part of one building still stood, and it was the Polish headquarters for the British Informed Bible Society. I find it very interesting that I read this illustration. Still legible on a surviving wall there of that, bu- of that building were these words. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. In a war-torn place, thank God for those words. God's words are living words, they are, and they have spiritual power. They're not words of man, friend. They're words of Almighty God, God's word. It ought to be precious to us today. Jesus said, and you're in our passage today, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them. That's that's the important key. There's the key, the whole message right there. Whoever hears these words of mine and does them. If we measure ourselves by his standards, if we evaluate our ethics by his ethics, if we strive to follow his teaching, the word of God, then, friend, we are building on the rock a sure foundation. Are you building on that today? Otherwise, you're building your life on sand that will ultimately bring you to disappointment and destruction. I love the way the songwriter said it. You are lost in sin, no hope within. Look to Jesus and live. Would you do that today, friend? If you're building your life on sand, man's ideas, man's philosophies, man's religion, my friend, it's going to come tumbling down. It's going to end with the judgment of Almighty God. Build your life on Jesus, the rock that gives eternal life. Would you come to him and call upon him today?